Welcome to season 11 of the Parenting Aces podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and Coach Todd Whittem is back with us this week discussing college tennis and college tennis recruiting and some of the obstacles that American players face when trying to get noticed by these college coaches. It's a really good conversation, one that parents really need to listen to. Coaches, it's for you too um, to understand what the landscape is like out there these days. And players, if you aspire to play college tennis, you need to understand what the process is like as well. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Before I bring Todd on, just a quick reminder that if you are a premium member of Parenting Aces, you are entitled to complimentary consults with me. And I love doing those consults. So please go ahead and schedule. You can do it through the contact tab on our website, parentingaces.com. Get on my online scheduler and pick a day and time that works for you. And we will chat about whatever it is that you're concerned about, whether it's junior development, college recruiting, choosing a coach, picking a summer program, nutrition, fitness, whatever it is, I am here to help and refer you to the appropriate resources when I can. So look forward to those meetings. For now, sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Coach Todd Whittem. Well, hey, Todd, glad you're back. We've got kind of a hot topic today, I think. I'm ready. I hope you're ready. <laughs> I'm always ready. Um, as we were saying before we started recording, I've been out at the USTA SoCal Pro Circuit matches today, saw some quarterfinal matches on the men's and women's side, really good tennis and um, some current and recently graduated college players out there. And uh, that was always fun. It's always fun to see them back out on the court and competing. And then there were some really amazing juniors competing out there as well against these uh, college players and, and guys and gals that have been out on tour. So really good tennis happening in Southern California this summer. It's been fun. Well, I'm sure I always enjoyed playing in California as well. The weather is nicer this time of the year than maybe here in South Florida. Huh? Yeah. Where, uh, the players are, uh, they're dealing with some heat, heat and everything, especially for the participants at the super national clay courts. Yeah, absolutely. As I, there's been some rain at clay courts and has the heat been bad this week? I haven't heard anybody complaining about the heat, but I've just heard about the rain delays. It's hot. And especially if you were coming from California, you probably need some weeks here in the, in this temperature to, uh, you know, get through the matches. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So our topic this time is talking about how do you get good enough to be eligible and desirable as a college player here in the U S and there's been, you know, this long standing conversation about why coaches are going to international players to bring them onto their teams as opposed to recruiting close to home. And some coaches, you know, to be fair, some coaches really do try to recruit close to home. Others, you know, have found that they can put together a better team by recruiting internationally. And what I found so interesting, you recently sent me a graphic that shows over 60% of college tennis players on both the men's and the women's side are international. So the majority of college tennis players are coming from outside the U.S., which I can already see the smoke coming out of people's ears listening to this um, that are frustrated by that. And I want to say that, you know, I used to be one of those people that got very frustrated by the high number of international kids on the college teams. But after watching my son go through the process, and I've talked about this a lot, but his best friend in the whole world is a guy that was on his college tennis team from, uh, excuse me, from New Zealand. I almost said Australia. That's crazy. Um, no, New Zealand. And, um, you know, but for college tennis, they never would have met each other. So, I love the international aspect, but I also sympathize and, 
you know, understand the frustration of American parents who invest so much time and money in their child's tennis development and then face these barriers when it's time to get recruited to play college tennis. So I wanted to talk about what you feel as a coach who works with players who are college bound. What do you feel are some of the issues that we need to work on here at home to help our players be better ready to get recruited and perform well at the collegiate level. Absolutely. So, you know, just so the viewers understand, this is that statistic, you know, over 60% was for division one men and women. Yes. Not, not, not just, you know, all the divisions and everything. Right. Right. So. Oh, and I should say that's from 2018 and I tried to find more current stats, but wasn't able to locate them. So. I think it's more now, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, I mean, we could talk about this for a long time. So, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're assessing students all the time, you know, in my arena, whether they're coming as a visitor or maybe a full-time student. And, you know, in my mind as, as a coach and someone that, that is on the court all day long and everything, I mean, there are certain things and certain fundamentals that you expect players to have by, a certain age, or maybe you're behind, right? And so when we talk about colleges, you know, that's a, it's a business, right? The college coaches, these are terrific jobs, right? The, the college coaches have, have most likely been an assistant for a certain amount of time, maybe, you know, relocated all throughout the country and then, you know, slid into a very good and, and, and nice head coaching position. And so to keep their job, they need, you know, certain results, and they're going to go and try to recruit any player that will help them, you know, keep their job. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's very, it's very normal. I think, you know, that that's, that's basically what's going on. Um, you know, in terms of American tennis players, you know, I, I believe, you know, and you know, there's, there's different arenas that players get produced in, right. It could be maybe a big Academy. It could maybe be a private tennis coach. It could, you know, maybe, maybe a country club, but you know, when, when, when I look at, you know, players that are, you know, coming into my arena and, you know, obviously they're maybe, you know, going to other arenas and everything, you know, like I said, the fundamentals, but, it, but the bottom line is that it starts with the daily training that the child is receiving. Right. And the way that the, 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 the other thing that I look at is that if you have an arena you know, and you're a parent that maybe doesn't know a lot about tennis, which is okay. If you look at the arena and there, there's 50 kids or there's a hundred kids, you need to do your research because you're about to make a tremendous investment of time, energy, money into, into your child and into, you know, the system or the academy. And you need to, you need to be realistic with your child, but also understand that, you know, basically with, with tennis arenas, it comes down to the quality that your child is receiving on a daily basis and what are they learning? This is like going to school. If your child is not learning or your child is not improving, there are players all throughout the whole world that are, okay? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the way that, that I look at it. That's the way that my, my partner and longtime coach Pierre looks at it is that what is this child learning, right? And are they retaining the information? They understand the information. They can apply it on a daily basis. That's, that's first and foremost. But going back to, you know, say an arena has 100 kids and maybe only one or a couple go to, you know, a really good college and they're starters. What about the others? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's something that you have to look into is that, you know, hey, everybody wants to advertise the kid that goes to Harvard or the kid that's going to Stanford. And, and wow, that is great. I mean, it's fantastic, right? I mean, you know, sure. I love my students to Ivy League schools. I mean, it's fantastic. It's fantastic for my business, right? But at the end of the day, what about the 90 something percent of the rest of the students? That is something that you need to look at mm -hmm. because in the whole scheme of it, the number scheme you know, someone's going to make it out alive. I call it someone's going to make it out where, Hey, they're going to be good. Right. And, you know, there's a hundred kids, there's 200 kids sometimes at these, uh, at these, you know, mass academies. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. 
But what about the vast majority? Where are they going? Where are they playing in the lineups? That's something that the parents have to do their research about, right? And if, and if they really want their child to do well, who is training their child? And what, it, what are the previous results? And how long have you, have you trained those particular players for? I mean, you're about to make a tremendous investment of time, energy, and money. Mm-hmm. Right. So you better know what is going on and, 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 and all these details that I just shared. So in your opinion, when you see kids come from other countries and, and I know you see them a lot because you're in South Florida and, you know, there are a lot of tournaments that you're getting to see and a lot of college matches that you're getting to see. What do these international players bring to a college team that, the U S players aren't currently bringing. Well, it's a case by case basis, but you know, I, and you hear about it and, and the college coaches, they are overseas, right? You know, there's many overseas right now in the summer. Um, you know, (laughs) I mean, you know, some are here to make a better life, right? So they're very, they're very hungry. You know, they, they'll do anything to maybe get out of a, a struggling situation, right? Mm-hmm. They'll, you know, whatever the coach says they'll do, um, you know, Hey, this is parenting aces. So one of the, one of the first things that a college coach does here in America is they look at the parenting situation, right? That that's something mm-hmm. that maybe, maybe, maybe a lot of viewers don't, don't know is that they want to know how the parents are. They can always look at results. I mean, that's easy. You go on UTR, go you know, figure it out, right? They can figure out, oh, yeah. this player is good, this UTR is this, whatever, the rating, the ranking. They can find that without even looking at that at that student's uh, or that crowd's face, right? Or even seeing them hit a tennis ball, I had right? A, I had a college coach tell me this week that they passed on a really good player because of the parent. And... Right you know, it was a really tough decision on the part of the coach because the player would have been a huge benefit to the team, but the coach just did not want to be in a situation of having to deal with this parent for four years. So you're, you're absolutely right. This is something that I hear pretty regularly. And, and this is why I tell parents, you've got to let your child drive the recruiting process. You've got to step back and let them be the one that's interacting with the coach. And, you know, the coach needs to get to know the player, you as the parent, once your child goes to college, you have very little input (laughs) and very little power over what happens to them day to day. It's just the realities of being in college, not just college athletics, but college in general. Yeah. I mean, you know, the coaches are looking for specific mentalities, maybe upbringings, you know, of, of, of players, you know, they're looking for a certain, certain work ethic. They also understand that if they bring in maybe a bad apple that can cost them their job, Mm -hmm. understand that. Right. And so in my arena, as well as, you know, what you just, you know, spoke about is that if I see a parent that, you know, this isn't going to work out, unfortunately, we're not going to be going down this path of having that student in in my arena. Mm -hmm. Tough decisions, not fun, but you know what, in, you know, with, with business, that's just, that's just how it is. And, you know, whether it's a college coach or myself, I want to get on the court with students that I really enjoy training and, and, and that I want to spend my hours with, right? Well, and like you, Todd, a college team is a small group of people. Your arena, you have a very, you know, limited number of students that you take. So it's, it's very comparable. You, you have to be picky because as you right. said, you know, you get one person in there that rocks the boat, the whole thing can fall apart. So it's, right. it's a tough call, but But I want to go back to this notion of besides the parents and, you know, we get it with international kids, the parents are far, far away and hopefully not, you know, bugging the coaches on a day to day basis. And so that's a plus on one end, but tennis wise and attitude wise, what are you seeing the international players bring to the table? that the American players may be lacking? 
Sure. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think maybe, maybe they're grateful. I think they're hungry. Um, you know, they're may, maybe trying to start a new life. <clears throat> maybe, maybe some of the, maybe some of the, the, the foreign players have been to the army, right? You know, they've been through a lot, you know, as well as <clears throat> some have played pro tennis. Mm-hmm. I mean, think of it this way is that, you know, even myself, I started playing pro tennis at 16, even though I went to college and I played at the University of Miami, right? So when you start talking about the experiences that, that these players have been through compared to the American player, it's many times not a tough decision for the college coach to bring in a foreign tennis player, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you see, you know, sometimes maybe, maybe an American, an American player taking a gap year, that's, that's becoming more and more popular for maturity, maybe mental and physical. Um, Which, but- let me just throw out there in Division One, that means they're losing a year of eligibility. So I just want to throw that out to the parents that are thinking, oh, my kid might be a good candidate for a gap year. That may absolutely be true, but just go into it understanding that if they are looking to play division one tennis, they could lose a year of eligibility by taking a gap year. That's yeah. That's if they play a tournament, right? They can't, they can play a tournament for the first six months Mm -hmm. right? after they graduate, but then they can't play a tournament and compete in a tournament for the next six months until they go to college. Right. In D3, they can. Right. Yeah. So yeah, under, we're doing this right now. The reason I know this, because we're doing this right now with a student, right. That we, that, you know, she actually thought that in her best interest would be to take a gap year. Mm-hmm. We let her decision. Um, but, you know, with, with, with the foreign, you know, with the foreign tennis players, I mean, you know, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're playing tennis, maybe, you know, for maybe for different reasons, right. Then, 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 then maybe, you know, an, an American player, mm-hmm. right? you know, and then, you know, like, like I specified. Um, so, you know, I, I would think, you know, being grateful to come over and, and, you know, you could imagine, you know, and I, and I was one of these players is that, you know, when I walk onto, you know, when I walked into the university of Miami, it blew my mind. Right. Because it was the first time, you know, it's, it's a, it's a private school. You saw kids that had, you know, you know, tremendous means, mm-hmm. right. I saw cars on campus that, that blew my mind. I got all of a sudden unlimited Nike clothing. I could go to a sports psychologist. I could get a massage. I had tutors. I mean, you name it, everything was taken care of. I thought I had hit the jackpot. I was like, Oh my goodness. This right. is incredible. The nicest car on the lot in my high school was a Volkswagen. And I'm looking at, you know, crazy, you know, cars, there's Ferraris and there's Porsches. And you're like, what, what world am I in? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And so, you know, the mentalities are different, right? The, the upbringing is different, right? You know, these players, they're playing for money. They're playing for scholarship money, Right. You know, and so but, but let me just ask you this. Are they better tennis players or are they better competitors? Or both? I don't believe they're better tennis players. I believe that if you're trained well and you're hungry and you're smart, you can play at a, at a great university in this country. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know you know, you, you have, you have kids that, that, that they're exposed to really high level tennis, just like myself at a young age, you can't compare. Right. Right. Because many of these players, they were growing up going through great systems of training and then maybe playing professional tennis and realizing, well, maybe I don't have the means to play professional tennis, or maybe I had a tough injury, or maybe I just don't have the heart, but I want to get a great education. So they're really experienced. They've gone through great training systems. So, you know, when we talk about the American, you know, the typical American kid who's, you know, who's, who's playing tennis and they're playing their nationals and, and sectionals and these types of things, you know, the foreign tennis players, they're exposed, you know, to some, some really high level training in tennis. And that's who you're competing against 
understand that, you know, if you're from, you know, South Florida or you're from California, you know, you're from these little pockets and bubbles, right? And, 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 and the mentality, right? You know, we always talk about having a humble mentality and being grateful and being happy and, and you know, and these, and these types of things, but I'm not always seeing that. Um, you know, many times I'm seeing kids where we have to teach them how to be humble. We have to teach them, you know, not to be entitled. That's not a given, you know, that, you know, you have to work for this, yeah. right? These, these types of things that that's many times, you know, what, what we're teaching as well. And, um, you know, the, the foreign, the foreign tennis players, I mean, they're getting exposed to some really high level stuff many times in, in, in their countries or they're traveling outside of their countries for it. Well, and one other you know, kind of, I don't know, roadblock that I recently became aware of for American kids is the NCAA now has something called elite athlete status. And if you have been designated an elite athlete by your national governing body, you are exempt from certain restrictions as a collegiate student athlete such as the 20 hour per week training rule in tennis. So for a player coming from outside the US, they can ask their national governing body to grant them this elite status. And now when they step foot on their college campus, they can play and practice as much as they want, work with the coaches as much as they want and as much as the coaches are willing to work with them. The USTA will not grant that elite athlete status to collegiate tennis players. They have said that that's not something they're going to do. So again, American players are being put at a disadvantage if they are looking to play at the highest levels of college tennis, because why is a college coach going to recruit an American kid that's under the 20 hour rule restriction versus somebody from a different country who's not under that restriction. And I just recently learned about this. I don't know if my listeners are aware of it. If you are, um, you know, I'm glad that you knew this. <laughs> I wish you had shared it with me. If you're not aware of it, uh, it's important that you understand it. And it's, it's another barrier to entry for American kids in college tennis at the highest level. And it's really frustrating. No doubt about it. I mean, you know, maybe the question to the USTA is, do you think college tennis for an American player is a pathway to becoming a professional? Well, I think their decision on this elite status thing is a clear answer to that question, um, you know, unfortunately. But USTA, you know, continues to give lip service at least to college tennis and as we're seeing at the international hall of fame tournament that's going on now they're having a showcase where they're taking some of the top college players around the country and having them compete at the tournament and you know i think that's really cool that they're doing doing that um i don't know if there's money behind it I, i'm I'm not sure how that's working, but at least these kids are going to get to be on a big stage and, you know, have some exposure, which I think is super important. But yeah, it's, it seems like everywhere we turn, we run into these walls um, preventing our kids from finding their way into these top schools. I don't think it all has to do with how good a tennis player you are. Sadly. Right. And I think you know, we've blamed we've blamed our country's lack of, you know, winning slams and all of that, saying, you know, well, American kids just aren't good enough. They don't work hard enough. I don't think that's true. You know, I find it hard to believe. Right. You hear it. You know, oh, the parents. Oh, the kids lazy. You hear it. You hear it all the time. Right. This, that. I. I believe that if you have a great coach, that great coach can develop a lot of different players. Right. Yeah. And, you know, in America, the statistics are showing that the, you know, the, 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 the customary groups and lessons, are they working? Are they? I mean, it depends on who you ask because 
the statistics that the USTA puts out says the sport is growing, but. Well, it might be, but we're talking about college tennis at the highest right, level. Right. The parents that are, again, they're spending a lot of time, energy and money. So the way that I look at it is that if I'm, if I'm a tennis parent, right. And, and, and I have the means to do it right and everything. I need to do things on a different level because what's going on probably is not working. Mm -hmm. You know what? It is not right. Let's, let's, let's call it what it is. It's not working. When you have a majority of college players from that are coming from outside the U S that is problematic. I mean, and again, I I'm all for having international players on our college tennis teams. I think it's a great benefit to everybody, but it shouldn't be the majority. Right. Well, you know, and the, 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 the thing is, is that, you know, I think that parents are going to have to be smart about, you know, how their child is going to be managed and their development, because the statistics are showing that what's going on with how good the American kids are. It's not working. Yeah. Right. It's not working. So you're going to have to go maybe down a different path. You're going to have to find someone who really knows what they're doing right? To help your child, what they would love to achieve because the customary, you know, you see it all the time on social media. Every coach has, this is how you have to hit the ball. Da, 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 da. Do you ever see a kid learning how to construct a point? Right. Well, that, ever- that's what I was going to ask because yeah. again, I don't think it's that they're not good enough tennis players. I Correct. think these kids are excellent tennis players. There's what- something else. Right. When you get when you get down to it, these are discussions that I have all the time with with my partner, Pierre, is that there's a couple things. Number one, the students that 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 we're seeing, we're teaching them how to train. Okay, teach them how to train. That's number one. A lot of kids don't know how to train. They know how to take a lesson and know how to be in a group. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two they usually don't know how to move properly on a tennis court. That's another thing that is not worked on. Mm -hmm. Number three, they don't know how to play the game. They don't know. Construct points. Construct points. And I, and I was going to make a video and I'll put it on social media next week. (laughs) Right. Good. Is that even if you're in a drill and I'm thinking about this as I'm going through these drills and maybe I'm hitting is that, I am always looking across the net, figuring out what that person doesn't like, Mm -hmm. whether it's a high, heavy ball, high softball, overpowering, ripping it through it, hitting an angle. They don't move well. That's always going through my brain, but that's the way that I was trained. I'm a, you know, I was trained from when I was six, seven years old to really be, you know, you know, competitive and learn the game, learn construction, understand the game, study the game, all these things so that you know, so that I can break down opponents. Mm -hmm. This not being taught. I'm going to tell you flat out. So you can take all the lessons and groups that you want. Right. But if your child doesn't know how to play specific game plans, compete properly, move properly and train properly, it's not going to go well. When you say train properly, what does that mean? Sure. So I'm not talking about like, you know, you can tweak some techniques. Most kids are taught already swings and grips. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about training, I'm talking about hitting specific targets. I'm talking about specific movements, repetitive over and over and over again. You own it, right? One day, if you can hit, you know, move well. And if you look at my social media, you'll see students doing it. If you can hit 10 in a row one day, right? 10 out of 10. And then the next day you can only do 10 out of 15 you're not training well. The Mm -hmm. standard went down. You're not doing as well. So when we talk about training, you're talking about the mentalities of the players, right? And molding them so that they can compete, right? And they can be a winner, right? And, 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 And I don't think that's being taught, right? They're, you know, what's being taught is, Oh, my son or daughter, you know, they missed a bunch of forehands. So go take a lesson and, and, and it's going to get fixed. Right. 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 But but normal, right. I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah. Double faulted 10 times. 
in their match over the weekend. So um, can you give them a lesson on serving? There's a lot more to tennis than that. Right. Well, so, so I want to just expand on that because I think this is a really important point, Todd, and, and maybe again, one of the barriers to entry of college tennis for American kids is that using your example, my kid double faulted too much in their tournament over the weekend. So I'm going to take them to have a serve lesson. It's probably not the serve that was the reason they double faulted, right? There, there was something happening up here between the ears that was probably a major contributing factor to the double faulting, but maybe a minor contributing factor. But regardless, that has to be addressed alongside the technique of the serve. You can't just fix the technique of the serve and expect them to go out and serve perfectly at their next tournament. Well, you know, yeah, a hundred percent. Kids need to be training under pressure. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> right? Thank you. Yes. How do we create that though? And why aren't more coaches creating those scenarios for their kids? Because we want our kids to go home happy. <laughs> right. We I don't mean, want okay. Home. We don't want our child going home being unhappy that they lost the practice set. So how many kids are being told that they didn't do a good job that day? Their standard was lower. The truth is, is that you didn't get better today. You were unfocused. Right. And, you know, that's why you 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 double faulted. Or that's why you were spraying forehands. No, I don't need to give you a lesson to teach you how to hit a forehand. You need to get your act together. You need to get focused. You need to get determined. And you need to own this shot. And you go hit a, hit a, hit a lot of them, hundreds of them, until you own that shot. How about that? Yeah. That's training. But, right? so okay, so then, then there's that line between being truthful with the player and the parent which you absolutely have to be and not undermining the kids confidence and shaking them up so much that they toss their racket in the trash and say, forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. Well, I mean, the, 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 bo the bottom line is that, you know, a coach is not there for a popularity contest. I mean, in, in my, in my, in my business, <laughs> I mean, in, in business you are the minority my friend i'm sorry <laughs> you know <laughs> i i want to get every single thing out of that player i can i want to try to maximize their ability right maybe it's a a great d3 maybe it's harvard maybe it's stanford but i want to know as a coach i've gone to the courts whether they've trained with me or trained with my with my team of coaches that we are getting everything out of that player we've We've, we, we, we are grinding it with them every single day to try to help them achieve their goals, right? That's mm -hmm. the joy for me. That's the challenge, right? And you know what? That student, to me, I would always want someone to tell me the truth about how my child is doing. That's just how I am. I would hate for it to be the other way. So there's a message in here for the parents too then, Todd, which is for you parents that are listening, that if you find a coach who is willing to be truthful with your child and with you and to do it in a way that is helpful, not derogatory or berating or, you know, beating the, the self-esteem out of the kid, because there is that balance, then you as the parent have to help your child understand what's going on. You have to say to the child, look, your coach is here to help you get, get as good as you can get because you've said, my child, that's what you want. So this coach is the one who can do that for you. If that's not really what you want, it's okay. You can tell us and we'll find a different coach and you can go continue to take lessons and do drills and play tennis and have fun. But do that knowing that the likelihood is you will not reach your highest potential in that scenario. So 
parents, we've got to buy into this and we've got to help our children buy in and understand what is required to reach these high levels in anything they do, whether it's school, whether it's sports, whether it's the arts, whatever it is, right? The, the, the mentality, I believe, and it was the mentality when I was growing up, whether it was from my parents or from my Argentine coaches, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And you're going to see how good you're going to be. And if you're not going to do it right, then done. Yeah, then it's not the right place for you. And that's right. okay. I mean, this is when we did the podcast talking about summer training opportunities, we talked about this. Not everybody is looking for the same thing. And that's yeah. fine. But if you are looking for your child, or if your child is looking, hopefully it's coming from them to be the best they can be, then they're going to be uncomfortable a lot of the time. That's just the reality. Getting to the best you can be at something requires discomfort. Yeah. It, as Nadal says, it requires suffering. It's suffering and there's accountability. Yes. Right. The only one to blame is yourself. Right. If you double fall, right, and you know how to serve, take the bucket and get out there on your own and go serve and hit targets mm -hmm. until you own it. Right. That, you know, you can do you can do things on your own. No one needs to hold your hand as well. Right? right. And so, you know, the kids need to be held accountable. And, you know, the coaches, everybody has their part. Right. That that, that they need that they need to do. It's a team team effort here. Right. But, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you, got, you got to have your goals and you got to be, you know, working towards them every single day because there are kids all over the world that are doing this. So if a kid is you know, not doing what they're supposed to do and they're not working that hard, just understand that, you know what, when reality comes and colleges, you know, when it's time for the recruiting process, it's very simple. There's UTR numbers, there's ratings and there's rankings and yeah. you'll, see, you'll see, right? Well, and, and it's, if you do have a child that wants to train that way, but you're having trouble locating a coach to reinforce that or to set up the environment in the proper way. There are lots of ways to get that virtually nowadays. Technology has made it so that you can call up Todd Whittem and Todd can do a video analysis of your child and talk to your child about what they need to be doing each day and how they need to be doing it. And then have check-ins with Todd via Zoom call or whatever, um, and and you know get get the program on the right track. Don't continue to waste time and money in a, a training environment that's not giving the child what they need to reach their goals. If the child wants it badly enough, there is an opportunity to get it, whether it's in person or via zoom call or, or something, but I just, I get so not frustrated, but I just, I feel so bad for families that continue to spend time and money on coaching situations that the child isn't growing. They're not growing as a player. They're not growing as a human being. They're not growing as a competitor. And it's just, it's so sad to see that happen. And it's, it's not necessary. No, I mean, players, you know, they should always be trending upwards, right? They should always be improving. You know, they also, you need to be around others, I call it, that are like-minded. Yeah. Right? If we're talking about, you know, Division I college tennis, which is a very good level of tennis, right? You need to be around like-minded students. And let me interrupt because that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be around players that are as good or better than you. It no. means you need to be around players that are willing to put the work in the way you're willing to put the work in. Right. I'm talking about mentality and the mentality of the coach, right? That the work ethic and, and the standards are very high. 
and the players they're under stress and they're under pressure so that when they, when they go to a tournament, they are so well prepared. Right. Okay. There are kids here in South Florida that are at super national clay courts that are breaking down physically. And it happens every year. It could be yeah. cramped. Fatigue. It's brutal down there. I've been there. <laughs> but here's the thing. And I was explaining this to my students as well. And Sun Kwan, very exciting. He's back. You know, he's training for the, for the summer circuit. I know you're watching my social media. We love having yeah. Sun and Daniel here. Um, is that one of the golden rules for a professional tennis player now is that you never lose a match due to fitness. Yeah. Ever. Why? Because that's in your control that you have trained and you're physically fit. Now you may lose matches because maybe the other player comes up with great shots or you had a bad day, or maybe you got nervous and you choked or you just didn't execute well, or your tactics were incorrect. Okay. Or you, you got look. injured or you got injured. You, yeah. I mean, let's hope not. Yeah. I mean, oh. Well, but it happens, but that's, that's not the same as not being fit enough to compete. I'm talking about running out of gas, right? Right. Tired. I can't handle it. You know, I can't get through this match physically. That means that you're not prepared to play. Yeah. Right. That the training or whatever, or your hydration or your nutrition, it's off. It's not, it's not right. Right. And so you're, you know, uh, you know, you're seeing these kids, you know, and I, and I've had kids come over for assessments from, from super national clays. Cause they want to come check us out and everything. And they're struggling. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, right. Not, yeah. not, right. How, you know, the professionalism, you know, when you start talking about the foreign tennis players, if we're talking about the 18 and unders here at super national clay courts, they're playing in a super nationals, but the kids overseas that are coming for, you know, coming to play college tennis, many of them are in pro tennis. Yeah. Right. I mean, you hear about it all the time. They have ATP points. They have, you know, the girls have WTA points. This player's 500 ATP. They have won a lot of professional tennis matches. And, and, and many of our kids are struggling to get through a super national tennis match. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about apples and oranges of, you know, physical, mental training, all these things that, that tennis players should be going through on a daily basis. Well, and, and I want to just reinforce this idea, Todd, that this isn't for everybody, right? right? This type of training is not for every kid. It's not for every family. And there is a place in college tennis for kids who don't want to commit at this level. There are plenty of opportunities in college tennis for kids yeah. that are not willing to work this hard, commit this fully, may not have the resources, whatever it is. But for the ones who do want to play at that level, there are some basic commitments that have to be made. And the most basic is taking care of the things that you have control over, meaning your fitness, your nutrition, your hydration, your sleep. Sleep is crucial. And if you've got a kid who says, I want to play at Harvard. I want to play at Stanford, but they're not taking care of those basic things. Then you have to question, do they really understand what it's going to take for them to reach that level? We have those students that, that you describe. We say that they're living in Disneyland. <laughs> and hey, right? it's, it's okay. okay, but just own it. Yeah. Own it and admit don't, to it. Don't, don't, don't BS yourself. Right. Right. Don't, don't, right. You know, don't, don't, because you're, you're not, you're not dedicated enough, you know, and, and what we're talking about now is, is division one. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's many schools, many different but levels. He, of even high level division three, Todd, require that yeah. same commitment. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah, high level is high level. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, I'm not sure the education is out there for maybe the parents, right. To, to fully understand. I mean, we educate the parents, you know, you, you've had some of your viewers come in and visit us. So yep. thank, thank you very much. And I say that this is very educational, not only for the students, 
but also for the parents. I, I like the parents watching mm -hmm. because they're looking at, you know, an arena that I think really caters to what we're exactly, you know, what we're speaking about right now. Yeah. That's the basis of my business. That is our expertise, right? It's not, yeah. you know, a hey, taking on a student where, you know, Hey, you know, they don't want to play college. They just want to hit some tennis balls that that's not, that's not our expertise. Our expertise is taking on a student that wants to play and is driven to play at a certain type of university or maybe a professional tennis career. That gets me excited to get on the court every day. Yeah. It could be three, it could be a division one, but when I have a student with that mentality and I really want to teach them, that is such a joy for me to get on the court every single day. Those are the students I love. And there's no guarantee that if you put in that type of work, that type of commitment, that there's going to be a spot at one of these top tier schools. There's no guarantee that the goals aren't going to change over the course of the junior development years. Um, stuff happens. But I think it's important for these conversations to happen, for the parents to understand what is required to play at that level, for the student, the player, him or herself to understand what's required, and for there to be conversations and accountability from the player, the parent, and the coach that we're on track and that the goals are still the same goals. And if they change, okay, but let's talk about it and let's figure out what needs to change in your training if your goals change. So I just, it's, you know, it all comes down to communication always for me and understanding what everybody is looking to gain is really important. And then holding each other accountable for getting there is really important. Yeah, I mean, everybody has. Oh. So go ahead. We had a little technical snafu there, Todd. Sorry about that. Some of the students that I'm housing. <laughs> <laughs> so I refresh my memory. Sorry, sorry. So we were, well, hang on a second. So everybody has to be on the same page, right? We talk about communication, right? I communicate with parents all the time. How is my child doing? This is what we need to do. These are the tournaments that, that need to be played. This is what we're assessing. You know, this is the type of training. How's your child, you know, doing mentally? How are they doing with their schoolwork? How's their life off the court? You have to know all of these things to really try to get the most out of each student. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it doesn't matter how old they are. If they have made that commitment, then it's important to, to hold them to those commitments, right? To say, look, this is what you said you wanted. Here's what your coach is telling you you need to do to get there. We, your parents, I, your parent, whatever your situation is, am here to support you financially, time-wise, et cetera. And if you decide you want something different, that's okay. But you need to tell me, and then we need to talk to your coach about that, right? It's crucial. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the worst thing, in my opinion, is when the kid kind of has this change of heart about what they want and what they're willing to do to get there, but they don't tell the parent and the coach that they've had a change of heart. That's when things go south really quickly. And I think it's important to, to have the conversation because maybe it's a temporary change of heart. Maybe they've had a bad couple weeks or a couple months or whatever, or maybe something else is going on. You know, and when you talk about it, you realize what's really happening. Maybe it has nothing at all to do with the tennis, but you've got to have the conversations. Well, but, but the coach would know that, wouldn't they? They'd feel that on the court. I if mean, I, one of my students, unless they're on court with 50 kids well, and okay. yours falls through the crack. Right. Well, all right. That, that's different. I mean, I can tell when my students are off right? When something's wrong, they're not performing in practice or training or tournaments. I mean, 
I, I, I know it. I mean, you know, my full-time students that are here all year long, I can tell, right? And so I want to nip that in the bud right away and, and get to know, you know, hey, what, what's going on? You know, is it maybe your schoolwork, boyfriend, girlfriend, nervous about college placement, nervous about your ACT, SAT? What, what, what is it? Nervous about a super national coming up or what's, what's bothering you, right? You have to know so that you can help that student, right? And you'll know as a coach, you know, whether they're, whether they're emotionally right or not, right? I mean, you could Hopefully, continue, you know, if I mean, you're a you, good coach. Yeah. I mean, you know what, you're going to continue doing groups and lessons with that student and knowing that they're emotionally not right and not there. Okay. Todd, you know, as well as I do, it happens all the time. So, you know, this is why it's so important that these lines of communication stay open and that you ask the student to recommit periodically. You know, what is this still what you want? It's okay if you've changed your mind, just be honest and, and let's move forward based on what you need and want out of this. Because tennis is, it's a massive commitment on all parties from a lot of different perspectives. I, you know, I don't need to tell you all that. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I went through very tough times as, as a junior player as well. A lot of doubting. It was very tough, tough moments, you know, losing early, going into consolation, you know, all these things that, that, you, that, that, that you go through. Sure. Times I came home from practice and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. These drills are the same. They're so hard. I don't like them. They're boring. And you know what my mother used to say to me? You want to be good. You're going to do it. <laughs> right. And, yeah. it, you know, as black and white as that. But right? that's what I'm saying. And, and, and by saying that to you, that caused you to say, okay, yeah, I do want to be good. So I am going to do it. But yeah, but you also could have said, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm done with this. And you know, I, I've only met your mom virtually, but I suspect her response to that would be, you know, let's take a step back then and give you a little break and see if this is really how you feel a week from now or two weeks from now. And if so, then, you know, we, we detour to something different. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, if we're talking about, you know, if we're talking about my upbringing and my mother, there's two main things that are going through my mind as, as you're bringing it up is that number one, she didn't want her kids to be soft and a wimp. Right. And number two, they are not going to be a quitter and whatever they start, they are going to do it full out and they're going to finish it. And that was the mentality from not only from the house, but from my tennis coaches. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was around that mentality all the time. Right. Which mm -hmm. I think, which I think is great. It's been tremendous, not only for myself, but thousands of amazing tennis players that, that grew up in, in the arena that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And, and, and some of these, some of these uh, human beings have, have been quite successful, whether it was in tennis or, you know, they're in their professional sure. life, right? Sure. Those amazing skills. So, but that, but that's how it was, you know, from my mom, they, you weren't allowed you know, it, it was not acceptable to be doing something, you know, you Halfway. know, yeah. mediocre. Yeah. I don't care. It didn't matter what it was. I was explaining this to a visitor today. It didn't matter if you're we washing or waxing the car, painting the house, pulling the weeds, trimming the hedges, whatever we were doing, doing fitness. You were never allowed to do it under the best of your ability. That was a skill that was harped on. And, you know, you are not going to cheat the system. Mm hmm. And that's a mindset that gets ingrained, right? And some kids thrive with that mindset and some kids don't. And, you know, you, you were a kid that did and continues to thrive with that mindset. And it's a mindset that you pass on. And it's why your kids that you train come out of what you're doing with them and find success on the court, in the classroom, whatever. But I just, I, I want to just put this out there that that's not every kid. It's not every family. And understand 
what it is your child wants, what they're willing to do, what you're willing to do and support as their parent, and then act based on those things. Don't, don't think that just because your kid says they want to be the number one player in the world, but then they go out to practice and, you know, they're goofing off and, you know, they really just want to hang with their buddies and whatever that they're going to be able to achieve it because they're saying it, you have to do the work. And as the parent, it's our role to hold our kids accountable for what they say they want and, you know, to help them understand what it takes to get there. I'm not saying you have to be harsh and, you know, yell and scream and all of that. There's a way to do it. That's loving and gentle and, and, you know, every family's got to find their vibe and their way of doing things. But I just think it's really important to understand what you're up against when your child comes to you and says, I want to play division one college tennis and you're living in the U S and you're competing against players from all around the world that are training differently that have different opportunities in college now with this new NCAA elite athlete status, um, just understand the system that you're working in and understand what it's going to take to stand out and get noticed by these college coaches at the schools that your child wants to play at. Yeah, no, I agree. I want to ask you a question now. Uh Uh-oh. No, but what I just said, like the mentality of how I was brought up yeah, with, with my mom and with my coaches, did you have a similar mentality with, with, with your family and with, yeah. with your son is that if you're going to do something, you're going to do it full out and you're going to do it right, or we're not going to do it. Yeah. And, right. and it's interesting because I, I, I kind of grew up with a mix, right? My, my dad was very hands-off. My dad was the tennis player in our family but he was hands off with everything we did. You know, if you want to do it, great. If you don't want to do it, that's fine too. doesn't matter. My mom was more like your mom of, you know, maybe it's the Jewish mama. I don't know. But, you know, if you're going to do, if you say you want to do this and we're going to start it, then you're going to see it through and you're going to put the effort in. And so my parents kind of balanced each other with that. In my family, my husband didn't grow up playing sports. So he's more like my dad that, you know, he, he had the expectations in terms of school. There was no gray area. If, you know, if you're going to go to school, you're going to put the work in, you're going to study, you're going to get good grades, you know, you're going to do well on your exams, you're going to do well on these SATs and all of that. That was an expectation for him. But with the extracurricular stuff, that was kind of my arena. And yeah, I set the same expectation. If you start something, you're going to see it through. So whether it was signing up for a soccer team or signing up for pottery class or horseback riding lessons, you know, whatever the period was that we signed up for, the child was expected to complete that, that time period. And for my son who, you know, had these aspirations with his tennis Once he said, I want to play division one tennis. And once we understood what that meant, then yeah, I held him accountable for that. For sure. And he achieved his goal. He did. I love it. Yeah. And after two years of playing in college, he decided it was no longer his goal. And you know what? I was heartbroken in the moment, but I got over it and I understood it and I was okay with it. So. He achieved what he wanted to achieve. It's great. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Todd, we're, we're coming to the end of our hour. If people want to get a hold of you, um, best way to do that. They could send me an email at Todd at TWTennis.com. Or they can find me on Instagram at Todd Whittem underscore tennis. Please enjoy the clips of Sun Wu Kwan. Yeah. Just Korea the other night. He's putting in some tremendous work for, for our viewers. He's the one that played Novak Djokovic first round center court at Wimbledon. 
and uh, my good friend and 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 an employee, Daniel Yu, who's been on your show, was there in the box. One of my former students, who's going to medical school now, was in the box as well with Daniel and his mother. So that was great. While I'm on the court, trying to watch him on my cell phone and training kids and trying to see how soon we was doing. But he played Novak Djokovic to, to four very tough sets. Gave him a very very tough match. So he's getting ready for his summer circuit. So you can see a bunch of clips of his training, which I believe is great. And he's been training right next to our students the last couple of days. That's so cool. Yeah. And in, I'm going to play with him tomorrow. So that'll be fun too. Very cool. Very cool. And we'll have links to all of Todd's social media, including his email in the show notes on parentingaces.com. Todd, as always, it's been a pleasure. There are always good conversations when you're on the pod. So uh, thanks for taking the time and um, I'm going to let you get back to your family and your players that are living with you, your temporary family. <laughs> so, yeah, really, we got, we have a workout tomorrow morning, so they need to get ready. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for doing it. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.